Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Father Dominic Legg from the Thomistic Institute. I'll give a Marian reflection and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Father Dominic Legg. He's a Dominican. He's the director of the Thomistic Institute based out of D.C. And I brought him on just to address some topics of faith that I think a lot of us have. One is happiness. What makes us happy? What's the, the path to happiness? Another topic we're going to discuss tonight is the role of faith and reason. Dominicans have a lot to say about this, so you want to stay tuned. Yeah, I think that point on faith and reason is so important today because a lot of times we think of faith maybe just as a, a blind faith uh, that we put no thought into what we believe. But really the Dominicans, they really, especially St. Thomas Aquinas, really challenges that argument. So we're now going to a reflection, a, a Marian reflection with Father Mark. <laughs> There are four Marian dogmas of the church, infallible proclamations we have to believe about Mary. One of them is the assumption that we believe at the end of her life, she was taken up into heaven body and soul, and that her body suffered no corruption, that she is exalted as queen of heaven and earth, that salvation is perfected, fulfilled, accomplishes its purposes in Mary. We see the goal, the end. And that's a sign of hope for us, that one of us made it. You know, one of us has reached this perfection that God offers us. And the good news for us is that she can now intercede for us from heaven, that she is inserted in the life of God in an extraordinary way. As queen and mother, she prays and intercedes for us here on earth, that she hasn't forgotten us. And this gives us hope. This gives us hope that she's the model and pattern of holiness, we see all the virtues in her, and that she's caring for us from this exalted heavenly position. Now, I also like to think of it in terms of friendship. You know, in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Friends who know the Father, who have this intimate knowledge of God. In salvation, he offers us this friendship. We know in regular human life, Sometimes we can want to be friends with someone and they don't return the friendship, how that could be painful. And there's something lacking in the friendship there. But in Mary, we see that friendship that's offered to humanity is perfectly reciprocated. There's a fullness in the friendship that God offers to humanity in Mary. It's, there's nothing, there's no sin, there's no impediment in her to refuse God's offer. So that work of redemption is done on Calvary. Mary's there at the foot of the cross to receive those gifts of salvation and we see it fulfilled, perfected in her heavenly blessed life. And the good news is that she's there praying for us, inserted in the life of God in an extraordinary way to intercede for us. May the Lord give you his peace. Father Dominic Legg, welcome to uh, Life on the Rock. You're the director of the Thomistic Institute in D.C. And we wanted to have you on again just to talk about some of these topics you all address largely with university students, uh, some of the, the big common questions they have. And I know in the last show we did, you talked about uh, how Thomas can synthesize, can bring things together, the show the big picture, kind of what's it all about, and how does this bless me, you know, how does this lead to my happiness? Let's start with that. Uh, let's talk about the happiness question first. What does he say about happiness? <laughs> well, I think people today are very acutely interested in this, uh, and a lot of people feel like um, they need more happiness in their life, or they're, they're not sure where to find uh, a greater sense of satisfaction or happiness. And Aquinas asked this question in the Summa Theologiae, and actually as a part of, he's really summarizing and synthesizing a long uh, history of 
philosophical and theological reflection on that, especially from Boethius and St. Augustine. And what Aquinas does is basically he says, well, you know, um, happiness is about getting to the goal that you're aiming at or arriving at what will satisfy you. And what will satisfy you? He says, well, in the end, it's only going to be what is good and, in fact, what is perfective of you. So the beginning of Aquinas' treatment on happiness is uh, really asking, well, what will kind of perfect a human life? What will lead you to a place where you are satisfied such that you don't keep wanting more? And he goes through a list of candidates that people often have put forward or often, in, you know, sort of in fact uh, tried to attain in their lives, in their search for happiness. He asks, you know, will, will money do it uh, for you? Will, will uh, other possessions do it for you? And he says, no, those are not good candidates for making you lastingly happy. I mean, if you have a lot, in fact, a lot of people who are very wealthy uh, are not that happy. Um, will uh, fame uh, do it for you? Will honor? Uh, I mean, you can think about some um, famous cases of uh, actors or rock stars who live really, in a certain way, miserable lives. Uh, I mean, they, they, they seem like they're happy from the outside, and then you find out later that they've had a lot of struggles and a lot of turmoil and a lot of trials uh, in their lives. Sometimes it can be quite sad. So fame doesn't do it for you either. Uh, neither does, does honor or something like that. Does power. Um, and Aquinas goes through all of these candidates and sort of shows philosophically that in the end, you're not going to be completely satisfied by them. There's going to be something missing. Uh, and the only real answer in the end for Aquinas is the perfect good, the good that is absolutely without any, uh, anything missing, the good that is infinitely good. And what is that? It's nothing less than God himself. So for Aquinas, the only real recipe for true happiness is to orient your life towards God, to be moving towards God, ultimately to attain to God himself. And that's only possible by the power of grace, which God gives us through Christ. So uh, in a certain way, that's, that's the, the short answer to the question. There's one other very important piece that Aquinas talks about uh, as, a, as part of his answer, and that's about virtue. Uh, often we will talk about virtues, you know, well, you should be uh, just and temperate and courageous and prudent, to name the cardinal virtues, for example. Um, we think about virtue as, well, these things that I ought to do. But Aquinas really understands them as the dispositions, the stable dispositions of spirit or of soul that a person can develop, which help you get to happiness. So if you ask, okay, well, it's you know, fine to come up with an abstract account of like what's going to make me happy. Ultimately, it's only God that will, will make me happy. And you say, well, how can I actually get there? You know, like, great, Father, thanks for that, but uh, you know, I'm trying to live my life in the real world here. What should I do? And Aquinas' answer is, you should live a virtuous life. Like a virtuous life, that's the life that is actually going to put you on the trajectory towards true happiness. And that means not only a virtuous life in the natural order, like being prudent and just and temperate and courageous, but also the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, those are the ways that we really get put on the, you might say, the supernatural trajectory towards friendship with God and towards uh, perfect communion with Him in heaven, God willing. Yeah, to me, it's, uh, I like that argument or that analysis, like perfecting our own abilities and stuff, and certainly virtue will do that. It makes us stronger in a sense. And if we think of our intellect and will, you know, for knowledge and for love, that's all finds its goal, fulfillment, perfection in God, that experience, I can love him, and more importantly, he loves me. And as I grow in my spiritual life, I'm experiencing that love, that peace of having him in my life. That is, uh, yeah, we can, not have all the, the great things of the world, but still have that relationship that gives us great joy and happiness. That's right. I mean, Aquinas has a, a really interesting remark um, in one of his scripture commentaries, and I found it to be very rev revelatory for me personally. Uh, and this is what he says. You know, if you look at the kinds of um, desires that we have, like the hunger that you have for food or the thirst you have for drink, um, 
You're hungry for food when your body needs nourishment. And after you've eaten the food, the hunger goes away. So actually, you desire, in the, when you're talking about material things, you desire what you don't have. And when you have enough of it, you don't desire it anymore. So if you eat enough food, then eating more food becomes actually positively uh, unpleasant. Mm. But in the spiritual order, it works in the opposite way. And that's very interesting. For spiritual things, when we don't have them, we don't even desire them. But as we begin to taste them, as we begin to possess them, our desire for them grows and grows. So, you know, when it comes to like material things, if you think that the next iPhone is, you know, getting the next iPhone is going to satisfy all of your longings, you know, you can think that until you have it. But once you get the iPhone, everyone discovers that, okay, it might be, it might be fun for a little while, but after a little bit, you know, it's already um, obsolete, you know, let, it, let a year or two go by, and it certainly doesn't satisfy all your desires. But as you come to know God and come to become friends with God, so invited into his life, you begin to share some of the peace and the joy which can come only from him. Then you discover a, like a new zone of existence. And a lot of people have never really tasted that. And so they, they're kind of living on a lower level where they, they haven't yet discovered that there is this real possibility for them. Right. And I think that's one of the things that's very, very powerful to introduce people to. And one thing we hear in the culture that I think does such damage to the faith is that it's often cast as, well, either you're reasonable or you have faith, that they oppose faith and reason. And we've only got about six minutes left, so <laughs> maybe we could give us some bullet points on that. How does faith and reason work together? You know, St. Thomas has one of the classic treatments of this question, and what he says in the Summa Theologiae and some other works that he wrote uh, became actually part of the Catholic dogmatic tradition at the First Vatican Council. Uh, so it's a really important subject for Aquinas. Uh, he, I mean, to summarize very briefly, he says, well, listen, faith involves a light for the mind. Faith is not about um, something totally blind. Now, you don't see the evidence for what you believe in faith, but you, your mind is, in a way, illuminated by God's grace so that you will adhere, you will, you will agree with, assent to the truths of the faith without any reservation. So because God is the source of all truth, he's the source of the light of natural reason, and therefore all the truths that we can discover by the power of our own mind, he's also the source of the light of faith, he's the source of both, and they therefore cannot contradict because God cannot be the author of a contradiction. So Aquinas has like this supreme confidence in uh, both the power of natural reason and the power of supernatural faith, because both of them are from God. And so we should never be worried that somehow if I do enough scientific investigation, for example, that you're going to end up with a contradiction with the faith. I, I think Aquinas would say, uh, if you do science in the right way, you will not be able to disprove the Catholic faith. Now, there may be questions that are raised that we don't immediately have answers to. Uh, there might be apparent contradictions and we need to work out, like has science really discovered the truth here? Uh, or what is the profession of faith really on this point? Do we understand it? But in fact, there can never be a contradiction. Right, and I, I think too that, you know, it's often cast as unreasonable that God even exists. But we say like, by reason, we know that God exists. But certainly, revelation and faith take such much farther to God himself and understanding of the Trinity and things of that nature. So, you know, they, they both work together. That's right, Father Mark. And I mean, I would say uh, two quick things on that. Um, one is that uh, it's very reasonable for us to believe in God. Uh, and so um, we can come up with uh, philosophical proofs for that, and Aquinas thinks that he uh, has successfully outlined what those proofs look like. But the second point is, it's very reasonable for us to believe the other things that the faith teaches us, even if they can't be proved by reason. And why is that? Well, in fact, there's all kinds of things that we have to depend on other people to tell us all the time. 
even in science, there is a kind of natural believing because like if you're a student in a chemistry class, uh, you're not gonna go through and run all the experiments that prove all the formulas that you find in your textbook. You're gonna trust that the people who wrote the textbook have done the experiments and that you can actually accept those formulas as a, a sound basis for, for the work that you're going to do. And it's also true anytime somebody tells us like, you know, your, your spouse tells you or your, your parents tell you that they love you. Um, you can't actually verify that with a scientific experiment. You simply have to believe them. And it's reasonable for people to rely on what other people tell them even on things that are extremely important, like whether, whether your parents love you. That's right. Now we just have a couple of minutes. You're on many college campuses. The Dominican's doing great work. What do you find the young people hungering for? Is it like community fellowship, love, truth, beauty? Is there something in particular that stands out? Well, one of the things that uh, motivated our creation of the Thomistic Institute campus chapter programs, that's the, pro the program that we have on college campuses where students organize themselves as student groups and then invite in Catholic intellectuals to speak on their campus, and we, we help them do that. Uh, the reason we started that is because we found that on many college campuses you have a good chaplain who's doing excellent work for the spiritual uh, and sacramental formation of the students, and I think college campuses have have improved a lot over the past few decades in their campus ministry programs, and so a lot of great stuff is happening there. Um, but there's often not enough uh, of attention paid to the intellectual dimension of these students on college campuses, because they're, they're getting a high level intellectual formation and development in their secular disciplines, like they might be studying chemistry or biology, something like that, history, literature. Uh, and they're not always developing on, in the same way for their understanding of the faith. And that's what this program really aims to do. The other thing that I would mention, Father Mark, is that uh, we created this resource, Aquinas 101, which is a short series, a series of short YouTube videos just introducing the life and work of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, it's meant to be kind of an introduction for people who want to begin learning how to watch and, or how to read Aquinas on their own and how to think along with him. And uh, that's been enormously successful and I think has, has helped a lot of these uh, people like these students uh, access you know, that kind of information. Uh, you can find it, we've created a website for it, Aquinas101.com. So I would encourage all of your, all of your viewers to, to check it out and, and begin reading Aquinas on their own. Well, those are, that's a great Dominican distinction to make with that intellectual formation and you all are clearly living out your charism so beautifully in the culture today. So we thank you for all your work and, and keep it up. Well, thanks very much, Father Mark, you too. One thing I enjoyed about that interview with the Dominican tradition, I just always walk away thinking, well, I'm glad somebody's got it figured out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because they, they have a, a very systematic explanation of things, but I think Father made a great point underlying uh, this theme of unhappiness is that we can only really fully find that in God. Mm -hmm. So our challenge this week is to give God a chance. Give God a chance. You know, we all want happiness deep, deep down. We want peace. We want joy. Give God a chance. Give him some wiggle room. Satan's very good at tempting us. Our flesh is very good at being drawn to things of this world. You know, keep us real busy. Try to just stay on the level of like, stimulation, sense, mm -hmm. pleasures and stuff. Yeah. But give God a chance. Yeah, and there's one of our priests, I think it was Father John Paul, I just remember him giving a vocation talk and even saying, you know, we're, we're, we become easily excited. You know, it's like whenever you hear a song on the radio, it's like, oh, I love this song. You know, but if you just keep on playing that song over and over, it just gets old, it gets worn down. And a lot of life is like that. Things come and go in our lives that at one time, yeah, it's great, it's new. You see it all the times in relationships when people fall in love, they're all about it, but then over time it just kind of, things start to settle down and cool off. And, uh, and I think, but only God can really give us that peace, that happiness, and that joy, because God isn't just bound to this world. He's not just a physical thing that we interact with, but He is a spiritual being, you know, and He wants to give us those graces to really dive into that spiritual life, that communion with God. And uh, even in my own life, you know, I just remember, thinking that this one thing, this one thing in my life would make me happy, you know, 
And I remember it was like a prayer gi given to me, but I just remember finding myself, this isn't making me happy and actually I'm pretty miserable. You mm -hmm. know, and that really made me kind of look outside just in the here and now of this world and really just open my mind and heart to God. And that was a very life changing moment in my own life. So. Right. And so what we mean by give God a chance, you know, time, some energy, mm -hmm. effort, you know, some good reading, certainly prayer and listening at prayer and just reflecting on God, trying to lift your mind and heart to God that, to hear him speak, you know, to know his presence in your life, the script, meditation on the scriptures. So there's many ways we can give God a chance to give an opening in our life. And we'll send you into that vineyard with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you. May he give you his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through this world below There's no sickness, no toil or danger in the bright land to which I go, I'm going there to see my father and all my Oh